Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, we talk to James G. Rickards, author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis, and G. Edward Griffin, writer of the books, The Creature from Jekyll Island and World Without Cancer. We'll talk to James G. Rickards right after this. The best of the best. Randy Elvis Frisky and his Las Vegas show band with Cassandra Frisky. Remembering Elvis Presley on the anniversary of his passing. Bell Center in Surrey, August 16th. Cultural Center in Chilliwack, 17. Details at RandyElvisFrisky.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Sitting in for Phil Mackesy, here is Jim Goddard. My guest is James G. Rickards, noted author. He wrote the book Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. He's a lawyer, an economist, and investment banker. Jim, you got it all. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, I've had a fairly uh, diverse career. I'm a lawyer by training, but spent a lot of time in economics and investment banking and hedge funds. So, uh, yeah, I've seen a, seen a lot of different um, uh, facets of the puzzle, so to speak. Uh, one of my first questions is will the U.S. dollar remain the reserve currency? Well, it almost certainly will not remain the reserve, the uh, global reserve currency, but the question of what will replace it and the transition from where we are to where we're going are really important issues, obviously, of interest to investors. And that's where I think a lot of people kind of get off track because what they do, they say, well, given all the money printing, I don't think the dollar is a stable store of value, so it's probably not going to be the global reserve currency. And then you say, well, what is? I mean, in theory, something has to be the reserve currency. And so they start casting around, and most people look at the uh, yu yuan, the Chinese yuan, and say, well, the Chinese yuan is going to be the new reserve currency. Um, and that actually reflects a, a bundle of misunderstandings. Uh, number one, uh, there's a big difference between a reserve currency and a trade currency. We are certainly seeing the rise of the Chinese yuan as a trade currency. Trade currency just means... Uh, you know, I'm Brazil or Canada or Chile and I'm trading with China and China agrees to accept, let's say, Canadian dollars uh, when they ship goods and Canada agrees to accept Chinese yuan when uh, the uh, when the Canadians ship goods to China or it could be, as I say, Brazil or South American country or whatever. And that's fine. Almost anything can be a trade currency and all it really is is a way of keeping score and after a year or whatever, one side's got a surplus and the other side's got a deficit and you settle up. And for that matter, you could settle up in dollars. So the Chinese yuan is fine as a trade currency. But a reserve currency is different. Uh, to be a reserve currency, it's not just a way of keeping score. You have to have a pool of investable assets. I mean, what your reserves are is, in effect, your savings account. You know, if you and I make a certain amount of money and we spend less than we make, the excess are our savings, and we go out and, and invest them. We can put it in the bank or we can buy stocks or bonds or whatever. Well, it's no different with a country. You have trading relationships, and if you sell more than you buy, um, you're going to build up a surplus, and those are your reserves. But then it raises the question, well, what do you invest in? Um, and you're just like an individual. You have to invest in stocks and bonds. Well, when you have, you know, three trillion dollars of reserves, which is what the Chinese have, or comparable, uh, you know, kind of hundred billion dollar or more amounts, which is what, you know, the Taiwanese and the Koreans and the others have, there aren't very many markets that big. I mean, it's hard to find a lot of three trillion dollars worth of stocks. So you end up investing in U.S. government securities, U.S. Treasury securities, because that's the only asset pool in the world big enough to absorb those level of savings or those level of reserves. So what you need to be a reserve currency is a large liquid pool of investable assets. And not just that, but the assets have to have dealers and market makers and financing mechanisms, settlement and clearance mechanisms, hedging mechanisms, et cetera. There's a lot of what I call the plumbing of the international financial system. So when you take all that into account, the only currency that could be the global reserve currency is the dollar because it's the only one that has a big enough pool of assets plus all the infrastructure. So now when you go back to the yuan, can it be a trading currency? Absolutely, but can it be a reserve currency? The answer is no. Not uh, well, I've heard uh, from uh, friends in Hong Kong, uh, a friend who's the public relations director for the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, that India and China are in talks for a common currency. Could that be what we're talking about? I think that's a real possibility. What, one of the things I would look for is not so much an immediate replacement for the dollar as a global, global reserve currency, 
but the rise of regional reserve currencies. Uh, I think Russia is working very hard on a ruble zone that would include a lot of the former Soviet republics. So nobody in you know North America or South America is going to want ruples as reserve currency. But if you're Kazakhstan or uh, Tajikistan or Belarus or Ukraine or a number of other countries, you might want it because um, you can use it to buy natural energy or you know, natural resource and energy exports from Russia. So. You might see that in the old communist bloc, uh, a Russian ruble zone. You might see an Indian China. Uh, you might see a South Asian bloc that could include Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, for that matter. You might see something coming out of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Those are the um, six oil exporting nations around the Persian Gulf, not including Iran, but that's you know Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, uh, UAE, um, and uh, and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. They might come out with a kind of a dinar that you'd have to have to buy oil, et cetera. So. You could see those uh, regional reserve currencies pop up. But what I expect is um, I do think the dollar will fail as a global reserve currency, but it's not going to be any country's currencies that will replace it. What it will be is the SDR. Uh, the SDR stands for Special Drawing Right. Uh, it's issued by the IMF. Uh, so it is, in effect, world money. And I think the longer-term plan on the IMF has been pretty explicit about this is is to replace the dollar with the SDR, which would then be a real global reserve currency. And what would that do to the U.S. economy? Well, it's just a pathway to inflation. Uh, all these countries need inflation because they can't pay their debts. You know, the thing about uh, debt is that it's nominal, meaning if I borrow a dollar from you, I owe you a dollar. Now, it's an interesting question if, you know, because of inflation or deflation, the dollar is worth, you know, a dollar ten or maybe ninety cents in terms of purchasing power, but contractually, I owe you a dollar. Uh, and so in order to pay back nominal debt, you need nominal growth. And uh, we're not getting real growth. And so to make up the difference between the nominal growth that's needed and the kind of anemic real growth that we're seeing, you need inflation. Um, and so, but the countries uh, and individual countries are having problems producing inflation right now. I, I like to say it's a sad day when the central bank wants inflation and can't get it. Cause I thought inflation, yeah, was the big bugaboo you wanted to avoid. Well, uh, not really. Right, right now, uh, the central banks want inflation, and the reason they want inflation is because they need nominal growth to pay off the debt. Uh, I mean, you can have real growth with, uh, with deflation. Um, it's sort of a tricky equation, but it's kind of minus one minus negative three equals plus two, meaning you have one, you have one percent or negative one percent nominal growth, three percent deflation. And of course, when you subtract the negative, you add the absolute value. So minus one minus negative three equals two, uh, plus two, meaning you can have 2% real growth. But the problem with that, you can have 2% real growth in a world of deflation. The problem with that is you don't have nominal growth, which you need to pay off the debt. So these central banks have to get inflation uh, to be able to pay off the debt. But the problem is it's not working. And so you need some new way of doing it. And the thing about the SDR um you know, people don't really know what it is. It's actually not that complicated. The the Federal Reserve has a printing press, and they can print U.S. dollars. And the uh, the Canadian Central Bank has a printing press. They can print Canadian dollars. Well, the IMF has a printing press also. They can print these SDRs, these special drawing rights, and hand them out. Uh, but the thing about it is there's no accountability because the IMF is not democratically elected. Um, no one really understands what they do. And so it's a way to create inflation by printing SDRs, and when the inflation breaks out, I mean, it will show up at the gas pump at the grocery store, but the politicians will be able to say, you know, hey, don't blame us, you know, blame those guys at the IMF, uh, they're the ones causing it, but so it's just another way to, uh, you're not kicking the can down the road, you're kicking it upstairs to a higher authority, which is the IMF, so, um, and uh, there are the equivalent of legal tender laws in the IMF Articles of Association that require other countries to accept SDRs from countries that have them. So if the IMF prints them and hands them out, and I want to trade with you, and I owe you something on the balance of trade, I can pay you with SDRs, and you have to take them uh, if you're an IMF member. So there's a whole superstructure for world money out there that's not very well understood. And when people say, well, gee, if the dollar, if people lose confidence in the dollar as a reserve currency, you know, what's going to replace it? Well, it's not going to be the yuan or the euro or anything else. It's going to be the SDR. That's interesting. Uh, of course, people say the banks run the world anyway. What's the difference? Between, you know, the IMF doing it or, you know, the, the big banks in your country. I mean, the LIBOR scandal really shows you what happens when the big banks get together. They fix the rates so they make the maximum profit from it. Well, they, they manipulate every market in the world because um, every, you know, using the U.S. dollar, let's say, as a standard of value, uh, there are all kinds of markets. I mean, there's stock markets, bond markets, commodity markets, you know, et cetera. 
but they're all denominated in dollars. At the end of the day, you're holding some kind of dollar claim. So central banks manipulate the dollar uh, through monetary policy, uh, quantitative easing and other games, nominal GDP targeting, operation twists, and all the things we've seen coming out of the Federal Reserve. Well, if you manipulate the dollar, you indirectly manipulate every market in the world because they're all priced in dollars. Um, and we know the central banks manipulate the gold market. That's been going on uh, forever, you know, over 100 years, probably longer. Um, and so um, when you manipulate the yield curve, manipulate the value of the dollar, manipulate gold, uh, other markets price off of those benchmarks, and so they're all manipulated at the end of the day. One of the problems with that is uh, policymakers rely on price signals to guide policy. Um, you know, is inflation too high? Is it too low? What should I do? And you look at price signals to tell you what to do. But if you're manipulating the markets, the price signals are manipulated, and then you're using those as a guide to future policy. That's like drinking your own Kool-Aid. In other words, um, you're not getting reliable price signals because of the manipulation, but at the same time, you're trying to rely on them for future policy. So there's kind of a feedback loop created between the manipulation and the price signal inputs leading to policy, and the result is everything's adrift. I mean, there's no gold standard. There, from We had a gold standard up until 1971. More with James G. Rickards on This Week in Money right after this. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. My guest is James G. Rickards author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. So, Jim, what happened when the U.S. went off the gold standard in 1971? The 70s were a period of chaos when we went off the gold standard, and then we had floating exchange rates and hyperinflation, and you know the price of oil quadrupled. In the United States, we had three recessions back to back to back, and... 1974, 1979, 1980, off uh, 1977 to 1981, we had 50% 50 50% cumulative inflation in, in U.S. dollar terms. So it was a disastrous period. But uh, the dollar came very close to collapse at that time. In the late 70s, the dollar was nearing uh, the point of collapse, but it was rescued by Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan. Paul Volcker gave us he you know, raised interest rates to 20%, broke the back of inflation, offered investors positive real rates where inflation, where interest rates were higher than the rate of inflation, so you could actually invest dollars and get a positive return. That made the U.S. A very attractive uh, market for investment from around the world. Uh, and Ronald Reagan, you know, cut taxes, reduced regulation, gave us a positive business climate. So the combination of you know positive real rates and positive business climate from Volcker and Reagan. Um, gave the United States a period of enormous growth uh, throughout the 1980s. So from then on, uh, it was the period of what we call King Dollar or the Sound Dollar policy, and this was continued through Republican and Democratic administrations. It was the policy of Reagan and Bush, but it was also the policy of Bill Clinton and his Treasury Secretary, Bob Rubin. It, and that lasted till 2010, and so the world said, okay, we're not on a gold standard, but we are on a dollar standard, and the United States is promising us that the dollar will be a stable store of value, so we can build up dollar reserves, and it's all good. Uh, the problem in 2010, the United States unilaterally terminated the dollar standard. Uh, President Obama did this in January 2010 in his State of the Union address when he said it's the policy of the United States to double exports in five years. Well, the only way to double exports in five years is to trash the currency. So we've been trying to cheapen the dollar ever since, uh, but that has left the world in chaos because there's no gold standard and there's no dollar standard. There's no standard at all. Um, and all you have are all these central banks running around trying to outdo each other in the printing department. We're seeing with the Reserve Bank of Australia and the Bank of England and um, certainly the United States, Bank of Japan with Abenomics. Uh, they're all printing as fast as they can. And so uh, so all these currencies are, are going to collapse you know, sooner than later. Well, the, it seems that it's a race to the bottom. Everybody wants a lower currency so that their exports are cheaper, so they sell more. But if they're all doing the same thing at the same time, in essence, don't their currencies remain in a relative, you know, the same value? Well, that's what Bernanke would say. And actually, Bernanke gave a speech in Tokyo. Ben Bernanke gave a speech in Tokyo in October of 2012. And he said exactly that. He said... You know, the problem with the 1930s currency war 
was that the devaluations were sequential. You know, Germany destroyed their currency in 1921. France uh, trashed their currency in 1925. Uh, the UK uh, devalued its currency in 1931. The United States devalued its currency in 1933. And England and France devalued together again in 1936. So they said it was the sequential or so-called beggar thy neighbor devaluations that caused the problems because it was suboptimal and you never knew where, when the next shoe was going to drop. And he said the answer is exactly, exactly what you said, Jim, which is let's all devalue at once. Um, so if the Bank of Japan, the UK, the US, and the ECB all devalue at the same time, Bernanke's theory is that's not a currency war. Uh, it's like four, you know, skydivers jumping out of the plane together and holding hands on the way down. Um, and so what he would say is that you get the stimulus from the money printing, but you don't have a currency war because you're all doing it at once, and so the terms of trade and the exchange rate should be relatively unaffected. Uh, there are numerous flaws in that um, that theory. The first one is that the ECB won't play along. Um, the UK, Japan, and US are printing as fast as they can. Uh, the European Central Bank is not. What they said is they will print if they have to, to defend the euro to keep the currency from collapsing. But they will not print for the sole purpose of getting inflation uh, because they have an anti-inflationary mandate. So they're not sort of on the bus, if you will, or with the program from the Fed's point of view. So that's the first problem. But the second problem is even if the ECB were going along with the UK, US, and Japan, well, you've got the big four trying to print at once and avoid relative devaluations. But what about the rest of the world? What about China, Taiwan, Thailand, Indonesia, Brazil, Switzerland, Korea, all the other countries? They're the losers because their currencies have to get stronger. Um, and so it may not be all against all, but it's sort of the G4 against the G16. It's still a currency war. It's just that you've broken the world into two big teams instead of all against all. So uh, and Bernanke's you know, answer to uh, China, let's say, or Taiwan or Korea or any of these other countries, um, because because uh, what Bernanke said, uh, again, in his Tokyo speech in October, he said, um, we're going to keep printing money, and you, our trading partners, have two choices. Um, the money's coming your way through uh, direct investment, uh, hot money inflows, and trade surpluses, and if you want to maintain a peg to the dollar, you're going to have to print your money to soak up our money, and that's going to cause inflation in your country, so you're going to get inflation, which is very destabilizing in China. But if you don't like the inflation, let your currency go up, let it appreciate, and that'll take care of your inflation problem. Of course, it kills your exports when your currency gets too strong. So, you know, China and Taiwan and Korea and all these guys are listening to this, and they're saying, well, wait a second, why is that a good deal for us? You've given us two bad choices. Choice number one is we peg and we get inflation. Choice number two is we appreciate and we whack our exports and hurt employment. So why is that a good deal? And Bernanke said it's a good deal because behind door number three is something worse, which is we don't print and our economy implodes and we take you with us. In other words, uh, a higher currency and slightly diminished exports are the adjustment price you have to pay so we can keep the United States from, from going into a, a depression. Uh, well, that's how kind of fragile and bad off the world is today. Yeah, saying, uh, please go along with a poor policy, otherwise we're going to get sick. Right. You go along with our bad ideas because the alternative is worse. Well, as an individual investor, is there any way for you to protect yourself from all this uh, manipulation that's going on behind the scenes, uh, especially, you know, the International Monetary Fund, who we're not really sure controls what with whom? Right. Well, the, the best way to protect yourself is with uh, some amount of gold, and I recommend for investors uh, of your investable assets, so, you know, so don't count your house and your car and stuff like that, but of your portfolio, the money you have for that's liquid to put into investments, whether it's stocks or bonds or whatever, you know, I recommend uh, 10 to 20 percent of that in gold. Uh, I recommend 10 percent for the conservative investor, 20 percent for the aggressive investor. Uh, not more than that. I have some clients who have 50 percent in gold, and I say, "Well, you didn't get that from me. I think that's too high an allocation." I think 20 percent is fine because um, if you have 20 percent of your investable assets in gold, and gold goes up five times, which I expect it will, uh, then you're going to make 500 percent on 20 percent, which is 100 percent on the whole thing. In other words. You'll completely ensure your the, the real value of your portfolio, regardless of what happens to the other investments. Conversely, if I'm wrong, I obviously don't think I'm wrong, but if I am and gold goes down a little bit, then a 10, 10 to 20 percent value you know allocation won't hurt you that much. Um, so it's got a nice kind of asymmetric risk reward to it, um, but you got a lot of upside if uh, these policies go off the rails, which I think they will, and gold goes to uh, you know, somewhere in the five or seven or ten thousand dollar per ounce range, which I expect it will sometime over the, over the next you know three to five years. 
so you'll make a lot of money that way. But it, it shouldn't go down a lot. It could, uh, certainly could go down, you know, even to a thousand dollars or maybe less. Uh, but, you know, that's, there's kind of a floor there. The floor is put in by the Chinese because the Chinese need to acquire gold, uh, so that, um, they have standing when it comes time to reform the international monetary system. Uh, you know, if the international monetary system collapses, it doesn't mean the end of the world. It doesn't mean we all go live in caves. What it means is that the major trading and financial powers come together and rewrite the rules of the game and come up with a new system. Well, think of that meeting, another you know, sort of Bretton Woods type meeting as a game of Texas Hold'em where, you know, you show up at the table and you want a nice pile of chips. Well, the chips are gold. China's buying gold hand over fist. They're mining gold in China. They're the world's largest gold producer, the world's largest gold importer. China desperately needs to build up its gold reserves so it has a seat at the table and a good pile of chips when it comes time to restructure the international monetary system. I heard that yeah, if they continue buying gold at their current rate, they'll hold something like 35% of the world's physical gold by the end of the year. Uh, well, that's a little high. I mean, the, the, the physical gold, if you're talking about official gold, it's about 30,000 tons. Uh, if you're talking about total gold, that would include private gold for jewelry and watches and rings and things like that. That's a much larger number. That's about 160,000 tons. Um, so I assume, I assume if you're talking about official gold of 30,000 tons, 30% or one third, let's say, would be 10,000 tons. They're, they're, they don't have 10,000 tons. They, uh, but they might have, uh, 4,000 tons. Now, now the, the interesting thing is the Chinese lie about it. Officially, China says they have uh, a little over 1,000 tons. Everybody knows it's false that they actually have, you know, something like three or four or 5,000 tons, but no one knows that exact number. Uh, but the point is, uh, they do need to build up their gold reserves relative to their GDP so they can, um, be on a par with the United States and Europe. And right now they're not there yet, but they're getting close. So, um, the point is the Chinese, the Chinese are actually doing what I'd kind of recommend for the individual investor. The Chinese have three trillion dollars worth of paper investments, U.S. government securities basically. If we devalue the dollar 10% against the yuan, that represents a $300 billion wealth transfer from China to the United States. We're taking $300 billion worth of their money by devaluating the, the value of what we owe them. Uh, so you say, well, gee, if you're China, why don't you just dump the treasury securities? The answer is you can't. The market's not that big. There would be all kinds of collateral damage and unintended effects and feedback loops. And so you, you can't actually do that. But what you can do is buy gold and... Um, build up your gold reserves. And that way, if the United States uh, causes inflation, yes, the Chinese will be losing on the paper side, but they'll be gaining on the gold side. And to some extent, one offsets the other. So they have a hedge. The individual can do what China is doing, uh, just buy some gold. And then that way, if you've got paper assets and stocks and bonds and so forth, maybe they're vulnerable to inflation. Maybe they're vulnerable to devaluation of the dollar. But you should be making it up on the gold side. So it's a kind of a hedge. Uh, that sounds like golden advice for anyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being on the show here. James G. Rickards, author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis, has been my guest. And if you'd like to keep track of James G. Rickards' ideas on financing and what's going on in the world markets, follow him on Twitter at James G. Rickards. After the break, G. Edward Griffin, author of the books The Creature from Jekyll Island and World Without Cancer, on This Week in Money. The best of the best, Randy Elvis Frisky and his Las Vegas show band with Cassandra Frisky. August 16th, Surrey, 17th, Chilliwack, September 14th, Kamloops. Details at RandyElvisFrisky.com. My guest is G. Edward Griffin, author of two amazing books, The Creature from Jekyll Island, and no, I don't think there's a Dr. Hyde in there, and also uh, a book about world without cancer. Both subjects I'm sure people are going to be interested in. First of all, let's talk about The Creature from Jekyll Island. What is this creature, and why should we be scared of it? <laughs> well, yeah, The Creature, in a nutshell, is the the banking system that, uh, that the United States adopted back in 19... 19- 13, the Federal Reserve System. That's what the creature is. And the reason for the title is because the Federal Reserve was actually uh, created on an island called Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia back in 1910. And um, the story is quite intriguing. Uh, the fact that uh, something as powerful as the Federal Reserve System and something which most people think is an agency of the federal government, the fact that that was created not in Washington, D.C., but 
on a private island uh, away from the prying eyes of the public and uh, under conditions of great secrecy uh, was an intriguing fact that I ran across early in my research on the Federal Reserve, and I thought, well, why the secrecy and so forth? So I got the answer to that question. I found out why the secrecy, and in answering that question, I found out just about everything that we need to know about the Federal Reserve system. So uh, the origin of the Fed was on Jekyll Island, which in those days was owned, privately owned by a small group of billionaires from New York, people like uh, uh, J.P. Morgan, John D. Rockefeller, and their business associates. They all had mansions on that island. It was a resort island. And uh, so one, once I got into that, that was the, uh, the sort of the skeleton of the story that uh, led to all of the important answers to the, the questions of today. So that's why we call it the creature from Jekyll Island. It's about the Federal Reserve System. And why is it so scary? Well, it's scary for a couple of reasons. First of all, it has this this thing this creature this uh, what they call the central bank is a cartel it's not a government agency it's uh it's no different than a banana cartel or an oil cartel it happens to be a banking cartel it's private and although it appears to be public it, it appears to be a government agency because it has the power of government behind it but the fact is it's just a cartel of banks and they police their own industry not only that, they, they persuaded members of Congress way back in 1913 to pass their cartel agreement into law, and they call it the Federal Reserve Act. So basically what the banks did is they, they drafted a cartel. They came up with rules and regulations to uh, regulate their own industry for their benefit, of course, not for the American people, but for their benefit. That's what cartels do. And then they passed it into law so that you and I have to obey those rules and regulations or we go to jail, which is why it appears to be a government agency, because it has the power to you know, imprison people, punish people. And well, that by itself is, is scary enough, but then when you realize that in addition to that, they convinced Congress to give them the power to create the nation's money. Prior to that, the money was created by the Treasury and the old bills, the currency in those days, uh, said U.S. Treasury across the top of them. And they were usually uh, bills, um, means IOUs, or promises to redeem in silver or gold the amount stated on those little uh, certificates. But then when the Federal Reserve came along, now that money was transferred, the, the creation of the money was transferred from the Treasury, meaning the government, was transferred to the banking system itself. And now all those bills say Federal Reserve Note across the top of them. You might have noticed. That's, those words are highly significant. It has nothing to do with the government anymore, except that the government stands ready to uh, tax everybody to make up all the losses for the banking system and to, to guarantee that that you know, money is accepted. They pass laws to force people to accept the banker's money. They call those um, legal tender laws. So it's scary because that's tremendous power over the economy, which means it's tremendous power over the lives of every American. And most most Americans have no idea uh, of how this came about or the extent of its power today. And that is very, very scary. Well, sure. You see the word federal, you automatically assume, you know, this is run by the federal government and uh, the government's supposed to be, you know, for, of, and by the people. Oh. But it turns out Treasury... Uh, you know, with the Treasury Board taken out of it, and now it's the Federal Reserve, the people are left out of that equation. Oh, totally left out of it. They're just like cattle to be milked. Wow. Well, I, I'm just going to say, every time you pay your credit card bill, you really do feel milked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the that's how the uh, Federal Reserve uh, looks upon the American people. You know, not at, not as the body politic to be protected and defended and in the interest to be preserved and so forth. No, it, it's just uh, it's just uh, cattle to be milked or or slaves to be put into uh, into action to serve the masters. It's as simple as that. It's an extreme way of saying it, but once you really get into the nitty gritties of this operation and when you start looking at these bailouts of modern era, and these trillions and trillions of dollars that are being extracted from the American people through a process which they do not understand 
and being transferred into the banking system through bailouts and other mechanisms. And once you add all that up, you realize that when you say that the, the people of America become slaves or serfs to their masters in the banking industry, that is not an exaggeration really at all. In Europe, they allowed banks to fail. In the U.S., they said they're too big to allow to fail. Well, who said that? The bank said that. Yeah. <laughs> of course, the banks planted that idea, and of course, the politicians who depend totally upon the huge cash flow coming from the banking industry, they're very obedient to that thought. And so the idea really originated with the banking industry, but then the politicians picked it up. Uh, anything that's too big to fail is the master. So what they're really saying is if the, the banks are too big to fail and if the bankers are too big to jail, then they're running the show. They're the new royalty, and the rest of us are serfs. In the U.K., they've passed a law making major banking executives criminally responsible if their actions result in the failure of a bank. Could you imagine a law like that in the U.S.? Well, I've been advocating that for years. Uh, I hope that that sticks in the U.K. I don't. It seems to be a counterintuitive because I know in the U.K. they have a, a similar lopsided system that we do. The banks over there, through the Bank of England as the primary focal point, uh, they have a similar situation. Those are all private banks, even though it's called the Bank of England. It's uh, it's dominated by the Rothschild banking uh, uh, family, and uh, the idea that they would actually do that is just seems counterintuitive because I'm sure that they have the power to prevent that from happening. So I'm a little bit suspicious at this stage. I'm, I'm I would like to see the the fine print of the such laws to see if there aren't all kinds of little loopholes built into it. Because, you know, sometimes politicians will pass laws or give speeches that sound really good and sound like, boy, they're really cracking down on these big bad bankers. But then when it comes time to administer these laws, it's just so much puffery. Well, in Canada, we've seen that with our environmental laws. Uh, we see ads on TV telling us the federal government has doubled the fines for oil pollution and so on. Uh -huh. But at the same time, they've drastically slashed the budget of the people who would enforce those laws. Yes. So, in effect, no one's there to take these people to court if they do do something bad. Right. And I bet if they did go to court, there'd be plenty of legal loopholes to get them out of, uh, you know, out of the hot spot. Because that's the reality. That's not just uh, skepticism or cynicism speaking. That's reality speaking. These, uh, you know, these uh, hidden agendas are are everywhere, and money talks. And we're talking about the biggest sources of money in the world. We're talking about the people who make the money. The Federal Reserve System in America and all the central banks around the world they literally create the money out of nothing. Well, that is that is almost unlimited power. And, you know, I think it was Lord Rothschild years ago uh, in England. He said, I care not who makes its laws, who makes the nation's laws, if you, you give me the power to uh, issue the money. And that's it. You know, the, he who pays the piper does call the tune. And people don't realize that in modern in the modern world. They think that, well, we go to the polls and we have candidates and we can vote for these candidates and we've got political parties and we can choose our political parties and therefore we are the masters of our own political destiny. And that's the greatest myth of all because once you really look behind that, that facade, you find out that uh, the candidates are chosen by a very small circle of people, the ones that you and I vote for. We're given a choice between, you know, twiddle D and twiddle dumb, and they're both in the hip pockets of these powerful financial interests. It makes no difference to them which side wins because they win either way. Well, uh, here in Canada, the banks are the biggest contributors to the two major political parties. No, oh, yes, of course. And it's not just money. It's the influence they hold in other ways. Uh, the, the banks, if you look at the board, uh, the boards of directors of all the major corporations, and you see every board of directors is salted heavily with uh, bank directors, the people who control the flow of credit to those corporations. So it's not just the physical donations or the monetary donations that they make to politicians, but it's the influence they can hold through the corporations they control, including especially the media corporations. The banks can determine which candidates get favorable media attention and which ones get unfavorable media attention, and that's more valuable than money. Well, uh, a new study showed that uh, uh, 90% of the U.S. media is controlled by six companies. Yes, uh -huh. 
and what are those companies and who controls the companies? You can look at the boards of directors and it's an interesting uh, and frightening exercise to realize that the, the power, the real power centers of control are in the hands of a, an amazingly small group of, uh, I'll call them families. They're not necessarily blood families, but they're financial families. It seems to me, too, they all belong to the same country club. I would call it the, the Gulf Buddies Network of Financing. Mm-hmm. Is it really that small? It's really, it's really that small, yes. Uh huh. And of course, the, the power dissipates the further down you, the pyramid you go, but it does coalesce uh, at the top, and it's a very, you know, all pyramids have a very small top, <laughs> depending on how <laughs> close to the very top you are. Now, so- I know the next question is, well, who's at the top? And I, I really wouldn't know because they don't invite me into their little meetings, but I do know that it's a small number. I know the conspir- conspiracy theory people say they have regular meetings. They get together in secret locations. And uh, when you look at the results on the financial markets, how things can change overnight, it really seems that's the case. Well, yes, and it is the case, and it's uh, it's not only uh, mentioned by conspiracy people, as you call them, but by the conspirators themselves. <laughs> they talk about it. Uh, there was a very well-known book uh, published uh, a decade or a little over a decade ago, written by uh, Dr. Carol Quigley, a professor of history at Georgetown University. It's called Tragedy and Hope. And Quigley uh, was a well-renowned professor, hardly a conspiracy person, um, and by the way, he was the mentor of William Clinton uh, while uh, Clinton was a student at Georgetown. And it was, it was uh, Quigley who, I'm, I'm very certain, was able to get Clinton a nomination to the Rhodes Scholarship, which was the beginning of his political career. But that's a little bit of an aside because the reason I mention Quigley is that in this book of his called Tragedy and Hope, it was the history of one of the world's greatest conspiracies ever imagined, and one which, according to Quigley, is still in existence today, and which, in fact, is the most powerful reality of political force in the world. And he, he says, and he, this is his history. It's over a thousand pages. It's a, it's an amazing history book. And he, and he says in there, he said that the people who run this uh, uh, conspiracy, he didn't call it a conspiracy, but it was a secret society, uh, founded by Cecil Rhodes, he says that they do meet in uh, confabs and private meetings around the world quite regularly and work these things out. Uh, the only thing is they're not necessarily as secret because you take something like the Bilderberg meeting, it's very much in the open. Um, the uh, Even those who attend, uh, the record is now known, and people know who, who's going to these meetings, but they just don't know what the agenda is and they don't know what transpires inside. It's very closely guarded. But anyway, the point is that Quigley, who was the historian of this great uh, conspiracy, talked about it quite openly and uh, thought it was a very good thing. So you don't really need to go to conspiracy people to get this. The fact is that uh, meetings like the Bilderbergers, the CFR, and the Trilateralists, they do meet quite regularly. And the bankers do meet regularly in Switzerland, in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, for uh, They belong to the Bank of International Settlements, it's called. And that's sort of the club, the master club of all of the... Uh, international banks in the world. So, yes, it's not just a theory, it's a fact that these people do meet quite regularly and they do lay out long-range agendas to how to rule the world. Would it ever be possible to get rid of the Federal Reserve and other central banks? Absolutely, no. It'd be very possible. The, the mechanism is simple. Now, the effort it would take to make the mechanism work would be colossal. But the Federal Reserve was created by an act of Congress, and so it can be uh, abolished by an act of Congress. All you need to do is just get enough congressmen to say, we hereby abolish the Federal Reserve. It can be done. But now, how do you get enough congressmen to do that when they know that their political careers are dependent upon their friendliness to the Federal Reserve? That's the trick. That's also part of this hidden reality. More with G. Edward Griffin next on This Week in Money. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600. 604-699-8600. Welcome back. My guest is G. Edward Griffin, author of the books... 
The Creature from Jekyll Island, and World Without Cancer. Ed, taking a look at your book, World Without Cancer, is there a conspiracy theory there as well, perhaps uh, keeping affordable or free cancer cures from us? Well, again, uh, I wouldn't call it a conspiracy uh, theory at all. Uh, and in fact, I wouldn't even call it a conspiracy because it's out in the open. There's nothing hidden about it. It's just that it's not well recognized and a lot of people poo-poo it. But it's easy to prove. The fact is that the medical profession, not only of the United States, but of the entire world now, is totally, well, totally, 99% dominated by the pharmaceutical industry. And the net result is not a conspiracy, but a very, uh, a, a very profitable business relationship in which all the medical professionals go to school and learn how to administer pharmaceutical drugs for everything. And they're not taught about basic nutrition. In fact, I've had many doctors tell me uh, sort of on the side that, you know, my wife knows more about nutrition than I do. We had a half a half an hour of uh, nutrition in our medical school. The rest of it was all, you know, drug reactions and chemistry and that sort of thing. And that's what they need to know to, you know, prescribe drugs. So the medical profession really... Uh, it comes out of a training program to train salesmen for pharmaceuticals. Now, is that a conspiracy? No, not really. It's out in the open. Um, a lot of people working for the pharmaceutical company have defected in a sense, you might say. They quit their jobs. They like, can't take this anymore. We're, we're testing drugs, and we know they're bad. We know they have bad side effects, side effects, and we're told not to publish those effects and put them on the market anyway. Um, and then we go and, and push these drugs to the doctors and tell them how wonderful they are. We're not allowed to tell them about the side effects and so forth. So we can't stand this anymore. And uh, so they quit their jobs and they, they, they spill their, their guts out and nobody listens. The media doesn't pick it up. They write a book and the, you know, publishers don't really push it. It's uh, usually self-published. And, and so the word is there, but it just doesn't get out. It's not a conspiracy, but it is a fact that the medical profession uh, in the world today is heavily biased in favor of drugs and pharmaceuticals of all kinds. And therefore, some of the most promising treatments for chronic metabolic diseases, such as cancer and, uh, and diabetes and things like that, which are not communicated by bugs, uh, the most promising treatments come from nature, uh, from herbs and plants, and things that it's just regular food if we if we eat the right foods that that's where we find the control for these conditions but the the average doctor doesn't know anything about that uh something simple like eating blueberries a very good antioxidant i don't see any blueberry pills out there <laughs> no well you see you can't patent it now that's a very important point uh we discovered that when we were researching the uh the terrible dishonesty that was uh, shown at Sloan Kettering Memorial Institute in New York when they were testing Laetrile, which was a controversial treatment for cancer back in the 1970s, still being used, by the way, very actively and very successfully. But in any way, back in the 1970s, a lot of people were getting cured uh, of cancer by Laetrile, and they were telling everybody about it, said, hey, this is wonderful, I'm alive today because of it, and it was gaining a lot of momentum. And so the pharmaceutical industry decided that, hey, we've got to uh, put a stop on this because, you see, you can't patent it. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because Sloan Kettering tested Laetrile and they moved heaven and hell. They moved to make sure that their testing came up negative. We don't have time to go into that now, but in my book I show how they falsified the record and everything else. And a lot of people quit there at Sloan Kettering. They said, we can't, we can't participate in, the, in this lie anymore. We quit our jobs. The fact is that they falsified the record in order to say that Laetril doesn't work, and we want to blow the whistle. So, but anyway, that's neither here nor there. So they they did come out. A Sloan Kettering uh, uh, came out against Laetril, said it doesn't work. Blah blah blah. And then a congressman used the Freedom of Information Act to get a copy of the Sloan Kettering Board of Directors minutes at a crucial meeting when they were discussing Laetril, and in the in the minutes of that meeting, it said this. This is a, a paraphrase, but it's very close. It said, we at Sloan Kettering are not interested in pursuing any research with Laetril. However, we are very interested in researching the active component of Laetril that is effective 
so that it can be patented, end quote, you know? Well, there it was. If you understand that statement, you understand this whole issue about the bias in the industry. You cannot patent something from nature. But if you can examine what that natural substance is and find the component, that little chemical uh, molecule or whatever combination it is, that's the active ingredient, isolate it and then create it, recreate it in a test tube, now you can patent it. And now the pharmaceutical industry is all for it because now they control it. They can make a huge profit on it. But if it comes from an apricot seed or an apple seed like Lantril does, there's no way they can make a buck on it. So they're just not interested in pursuing it. Is there a website that people can go to to learn more? Or well, learn yes, more? thank you for that. Uh, we have all of the books and recordings on this topic and many more of a similar nature at our website, and it's called Reality Zone. It's easy to remember, www realityzone.com and it's all there. Thanks a lot for chatting with us. All right, thank you. Thanks to our guests, James G. Rickards and G. Edward Griffin. And thank you for listening. I'm Jim Goddard for Phil Mackesy. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of How Street Media Incorporated. 